Hey there, Suki here. Welcome back to my channel where we discuss all things indie horror. In today's video, we're taking a look at the adorable visual novel, Cooking Companions, by Dear Dream Studios. We're going over the story presented as well as my own interpretations of what's going on underneath that kawaii facade. If you haven't had the chance to play the game or want a refresher, I'll start with a quick summary of the story. We begin our game in a cabin in the woods facing four people, Gregor, Anatoly, Mariah, and Karen. Gregor is the overly positive strong man of the group, eager to help his friends. Anatoly is a younger man with a need to show off his intellect. Mariah is the young woman with a sincere and sweet disposition. And then there's Karen, <laughs> the confident, overbearing woman who is quick to speak her mind in any situation, even if it's not the nicest thing to say at the moment. The beginning of the game plays out just like any typical visual novel. But it seems like you have all come to the cabin under not so ideal circumstances, given that the four mentioned the need to go to the surrounding forest to collect resources and food for survival during their stay, as if there isn't anything in the cabin for them to eat. So this is no cabin getaway. The first few days you spend cooking vegetarian dishes for the group after they gather berries and wild sorrel out in the forest. During this time, you're able to speak with the different companions in order to learn more about them and increase your relationship score, presumably to woo and court them by the end of the game. However, things start to take a dark turn on day three, when a massive storm picks up and floods the surrounding forest entirely, making it impossible to continue to forage for food. Emergency rations are dwindling and tensions are rising. You skip meals as the storm rages on, trying to preserve your food rations, and you all go to bed increasingly hungry each night. You begin to have strange dreams reminiscent of old folklore and fairy tales, until one day, you all just can't take it anymore. Your companions suggest sending someone out to brave the floods and find help and gather what food they can. They argue over who should go when Gregor offers to draw sticks, making it completely random. But you manage to see which was the shortest. Hmm. Regardless of how many hearts you have, Mariah is the one who leaves. Teary-eyed farewells give the ominous feeling that this is the last you'll see of her. After the loss of your companion, you have another strange dream. This time, it's of you desecrating a corpse. The next morning, you awake in a different location than when you went to sleep, but you mysteriously find some meat to cook everyone for breakfast. The more of this meat you cook, the further and further into madness your companions descend, faces twisting and turning into grotesque images. Tensions continue to rise while the floodwaters remain, and the next to leave the cabin is Anatoly, forced by Karen's rage. More meat for you, Gregor and Karen. At this point, Karen's humanity seems to be hanging on by a thread as she demands you to end Gregor next, skipping the whole charade of letting him leave the cabin. She mentions learning from the books on your bookshelves, the ones about necropsy, and she's confident that she can do what you can. His meat will last you to a while. The next morning, you awaken to Karen kindly offering you breakfast of meat. A breakfast, she mentions, that Gregor the glutton took hours to convince to eat. Upon walking out of the living room, you find a dismembered Gregor on the couch. All of his limbs, save his useful right arm, have been chopped off by Karen. After a heartfelt conversation, you watch as Gregor dies before you. This enrages Karen, who says his meat should have lasted weeks. But you, as a character player, have had enough of her madness. You chirp Karen into the basement, padlocking the door behind her. The next few days are full of hallucinations, whispers, and a dramatic descent to madness for you. Now, before we get to the ending of the game, there are five other companions aiding you during your time in the cabin that I've neglected to mention. However, you're not exactly sure if they're real or not. They're the Chompettes, adorable sentient foods who attempt to distract you from your current situation. There's Cabbage, the leader, Raspberry, Bread, Onion, and Potato. They're all very helpful and positive, for the most part. They even give you a few specifically meatless recipes to cook for your friends. But are they actually sentient appetizers? Or is there something more devious behind these adorable faces and bad puns? I'll be diving into all of that in one of my next videos, so be sure to subscribe so you don't miss it. I bring the Chompettes up now because they are crucial to the ending of the game, as they convince you to go down to the basement to end Karen once and for all, telling you things like, you know what's down there. She'll only become stronger because of it. 
And in typical visual novel style, there are several endings to this game. However, they all involve you facing Karen in the basement alongside the Chompettes in the final turn-based boss fight. Ultimately, you end up either killing her, or if you maxed out your hearts with her, you two end up living together in cannibalistic love until the day she dies, leaving you to think about everything you've done wrong and how you've doomed everyone. And that's it, that's the game. But what's actually going on here? Where are we? What brought these people to the cabin? Who are Karen, Gregor, Anatolia, Mariah? Who are the Chompettes? And who do we play as the player character? Well, my friends, I think I have the answer to these questions, but the answers get dark. So turn off the lights for some top tier spookage and get comfy while we analyze the mysteries behind Dear Dream Studios, Cooking Companions. So first off, we're going to start with a question that's probably the easiest to answer. Where are we? Well, using the game's Steam page, we find out that the story takes place deep in the Tatras Mountains, a mountain range that creates a natural border between Poland and Slovakia. Now, with as biblically high as the floodwaters become, I think it's safe to assume that we are on the tallest point of the mountain that reaches up to 8,200 feet, located just south of the town of Zakopane, sitting right on the border of Slovakia. During your time in the cabin, you are able to search different rooms, and if you search the right places, you'll find different notes leaving clues as to what is actually happening. In these notes, we learn of the Butcher of Zakopane, who, as their name suggests, uh, knew their way around the carving knife. But knowing their title gives us a specific location for the cabin. Our companions also drop hints as to our whereabouts when Karen and Mariah suggest they escaped Ukraine, searching for somewhere safer for them. Referencing back to the notes we find, we can piece together when this is all happening as well. The story of the cabin takes place in the early 1930s, during what's known as the Holodomor, which in Ukrainian translates to killing by hunger. The Holodomor was a man-made famine in Soviet Ukraine which led to millions of Ukrainian deaths. During this time, there was evidence of widespread cannibalism, where more than 2,500 people were convicted of cannibalism. If this is what was happening at the time, it's not difficult to imagine why Karen, Mariah, and the others were fleeing Ukraine. But is their cabin in the woods safer than where they were trying to escape from? It's hard to think that it wouldn't be. This leads us to our next question of who we're playing as. So let's start with what we're told about the player character. One, we're scary looking and we smell awful. The Chompettes tell us this several times and even joke about how bad we smell. Also, when we search the bathroom and choose to look into the mirror, we are terrified of looking at our own reflection. Even after 15 times of trying to look into the mirror, we still refuse, getting increasingly angry at the prospect. Two, Dear Dream Studios has been very, very deliberate when it comes to pronoun usage in this game, especially so for what I'll be talking about in the next video. But the only pronouns ever used for our player character are they, them. Not he, not she, they, and them. Dear Dream Studios is intentionally leaving it vague as to not give away our identity. It's a visual novel, so I mean, we're probably playing a dude, right? Three, in the post credit scene of New Game Plus, we learn that the cabin we've been in this whole time is actually ours. We find out that the four companions all came to this cabin as we were down in the basement chopping up our next meal. You go up and greet the frightened guests with a question you've asked thousands of times before. Did you come on your own free will or were you sent? To which they respond incorrectly. Now, this strange greeting is a dead giveaway on who we are as the player character. Or at least what we represent. If you type it word for word into Google, you find the exact phrase is one recited by none other than the Baba Yaga of Slavic folklore. And the correct way to answer that would have been largely of my own free will and twice as much by compulsion. As told in the story, the maiden Tsar. We've been playing as the Baba Yaga this whole time. Now, if you don't know, the Baba Yaga is a cannibalistic supernatural being who appears as a deformed woman. But wait, before you all jump to the conclusion that we're playing as the bad guy, the Baba Yaga isn't explicitly the villain in all of her stories. She's more of a neutral force with gray morals, a mediator between life and death, who just so happens to eat children sometimes? For a good reason, according to her. Okay, hear me out. Actually, I don't have time in this video to explain what I mean, but next one, I'll explain why we, as a player character, being the Baba Yaga, doesn't mean that we are necessarily the bad guy of this game. 
Anyway, putting together our evidence of the grotesque, stinky figure, no he, him pronouns, and the infamous greeting, we can conclude that we are playing as the Baba Yaga. But our evidence doesn't stop there. In fact, there are quite a few other tidbits of info that stack up to that conclusion. In her tales, the Baba Yaga is depicted living in a secluded cabin in the woods, built on giant chicken legs? Okay, well, we have the cabin in the woods, easy, but chicken legs? Nope, unless you search underneath the floorboards in the bedroom several times, you find a chicken bone. Not exactly a hut on chicken legs, but the reference is there. And on the counter in the kitchen, we see a mortar and pestle, another reference to our dear Baba Yaga, who is depicted flying around in, you guessed it, a giant mortar and pestle. She is also known to cook people in a giant cauldron like the one you see here. So if our player character was really just a person living alone in this hut, why would they need such a large cauldron? I don't think they're throwing any giant soup parties in the middle of the woods anytime soon. Now, what's interesting is in some interpretations of the Baba Yaga, she is said to have powers over animals, elements, and time. Meaning we, as the Baba Yaga, could have even caused the torrential storms that flooded the surrounding forests in order to keep the soon-to-be victims inside so that they can't escape our cannibalistic ways. And finally, the nail in the coffin that seals this theory together of the player character being the Baba Yaga is this. Does she look familiar? Yeah, she looks almost identical to our favorite Sundere, Karen. Just dye her hair red and they could be twins. This woman is Vasilisa the Beautiful. She is in one of the most popular stories of the Baba Yaga, tasked by her evil stepmother to go to the witch to find light for their family. She ends up being granted powers by the Baba Yaga and she unintentionally kills her entire family with them, <laughs> as one does. But there could be no stronger proof that we are in fact playing as the Baba Yaga. The looks, the smells, the catchphrase, the cannibalism! Vasilisa coming to our cabin. All of them point to us being the Baba Yaga. So what's next? We found out who we are, but what about everyone else? Did Karen and the gang find our cabin on accident? Or were they guided by someone? And who are the Chompettes? Surely their adorable faces can't be hiding anything sinister. And what's in the basement? And how could the main character who is supposed to be the cannibalistic Baba Yaga possibly not be the bad guy in this story? Find out the answers to all those questions in my next video. Until then, check out my other videos here and maybe watch my cooking companions playthrough. See you next time.